Welcome to Havana, the big, beautiful capital of the Caribbean's biggest and most beautiful island. Over the next 48 hours, I want to explore the city with you, meeting the people, being dazzled by the colours and charms of the capital, and sharing with you my favourite places to eat, drink and celebrate life within the indulgent embrace of the tropics. Cuba's top airport takes its name from the independence hero, Jose Marti. Like Heathrow, there are five terminals. Most international flights arrive here at Terminal 3, and these days passport control and customs checks are normally friendly and efficient. Just remember to bring your travel insurance policy or you'll need to buy medical cover. Gracias. The journey into the heart of Havana takes around half an hour for a fare of about 16 pounds. Hasta luego. To see the city laid out before you, come to the model of Havana, where you can see the original Spanish settlement from 1519 and how old Havana, Habana Vieja, has grown to become the most marvellous colonial city in the Americas and today a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Here in the real world, you can see why the location appealed to the Spanish, a magnificent harbour where ships carrying treasure from the New World to Europe could replenish before crossing the Atlantic. In the 1940s and 50s, Havana began to expand westwards and upwards here to Bedardo. And this is the main drag, Calle 23, La Rampa as it's known, and it's really Cuba's Fifth Avenue. This intersection with Avenue L is the heart of the downtown area. Of the many places to stay in Old Havana, this is the most central. The Ambos Mundos, which means both worlds. It bridges the divide between the old world and the new. And one former guest loved it so much that he lived here for years. His name, Ernest Hemingway. The writer loved Cuba and created some of his best work in room 511 of this salmon pink hotel. Now, I'm not actually staying here, but luckily you don't have to be a guest to come up to the sixth floor bar, raise a glass to Ernest and drink in the view. That curious symbol looking like a capital H on its side means there's a room to rent for foreigners. And that is the secret for cut price lodgings. You'll also get to meet real Cubans. But this time I'm staying at the most celebrated property in the city. Buenos dias. Well, look where I am staying, the Hotel Nacional de Cuba, the greatest address in all of Havana. It opened in 1930 and has played a part in Cuba's turbulent history ever since. And it's now officially a national monument. Let me recommend room 613, where on one side you can witness the sunrise over the Atlantic. Out of the other window, have a look at the beautiful architecture a little bit closer up. There's an official hotel historian who conducts tours twice a day, but you might simply prefer to wander through the beautiful grounds and gaze out at the ocean. When you're 
are staying here, you feel as though you've strayed onto the set of a Hollywood movie. And to sustain that feeling, take a ride in a 1952 Chevrolet Bel Air. My excellent driver is Rojas, and he is half the age of his car. The deal is this, for a ride of an hour around anywhere you want to go in the city, it costs the equivalent of £20. And you can pack the car out with your friends. And if you haven't got any, you can always invite a cameraman along. There really isn't a better way to travel and to appreciate the scale and beauty of the Caribbean's largest city. Other forms of transport are available, from Chinese-made buses to bicycle taxis. Wow, what a strange sensation. You don't just get to see the tourist attractions, you become one yourself. Anyway, I've asked Rojas to drop me at the Parque Central on the edge of Old Havana, which is handy if you're feeling hungry because it's the home of the greatest concentration of restaurants in Cuba. Muchas gracias, Rojas. Trente. Thank you very much, my man. Very good. Adios. When I first came to Havana 25 years ago, yes, I was very young, thanks, there was only a handful of restaurants to choose from. Now there's dozens, so you can pick one according to the architecture, the atmosphere, or in the case of the Maison de la Flotta, the Andalusian dancing. Flamenco is part of the menu at the Maison de la Flotta. Performers like these in restaurants depend on tips from customers, so be generous to ensure the tradition continues. The restaurant is a former mariner's hostel. I just ask the waiter what's good for the day and hope that he uh, advises me correctly. Mm. Very nice. I think it's perch. Gracias. Time to walk off my meal, and I've got an appointment with a tourist guide, Liber, in the Plaza Vieja, about one minute's walk over there. He's going to join me on a stroll through Old Havana, a tale of three squares. So here we are, this is Plaza Vieja. Uh, originally was the place where uh, the wealthiest uh, families uh, used to enjoy their fiestas and the executions sometimes. Today is pretty much a place where people come to relax, tourists come to enjoy uh, the re relaxing time, taking beer, coffees, etc. and also Cubans as well. Then we walk down Mercaderes or Market Street, full of shops, and where the pedestrians only rule is enforced by the use of old cannon. We are in the uh, Plaza de Armas, the Arm Square. Over there we have El Templete, which is the foundational site. Uh, the first mass and the, uh, the foundation of the city was established uh, precisely there on November 16, 1519. Today is one of the loveliest squares uh, in the city. It's easy to be mesmerized by the energy, the color, and the noise of Havana. So here we are in the third square, uh, that is uh, La Plaza de la Catedral. It took its name from the uh, Cathedral Church. Uh, originally, the place was known as the Swamp Square. Uh, later on, the uh, place uh, became the site of uh, some of the uh, most beautiful mansions that belonged to the wealthiest families uh, of the area. If you don't mind me saying so, the cathedral looks a bit lopsided. That is true. In fact, uh, one tower was built before the other one and uh, higher than the other one. There's been a couple of uh, theories about it, but this is one of the most important uh, distinctive features of this beautiful religious architecture. Well, thank you very much indeed, Libert. My pleasure. Okay, Anytime. I'm, I'm going to go and see if I can get a bit lopsided myself. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. The most celebrated bar in Havana, La Bodeguita del Medio, which made its name with other people's names. Hola. 
And if you can battle your way through the crowds to the bar, this is your reward. The mojito, which is rum, lime juice, sugar and mint. And just what you need after a day in hot Havana. Mm. Presidents, poets and playboys have all drunk here and left their mark by signing the walls. If this has sharpened your appetite, then you can eat here as well. Buen appetito. And look, it's him again, our old friend Ernest Hemingway, who signed here my mojito in La Bodeguita. That was just the first half of Hemingway's signature sentence. The other part was my daiquiri in El Floridita. And guess what? Hemingway is still propping up the bar here. But despite the impression he created, you can do more than just drink here. <laughs> Mind you, this is the place known as La Cuna del Daiquiri, the cradle of the daiquiri. So it would be rude not to try it. Rum, lime juice and sugar with crushed ice. Just lovely. I stop at one. He never did. Time to eat. Gracias. El Floridita has been serving up dinner for the last 200 years, and for about the last quarter of that, it's been run by the state. Hmm. Really quite well. But it's always good to have choice. Competition is thriving in the shape of paladares, privately run restaurants. Originally, they could offer only 12 chairs, but now they have expanded with paladar los mercaderes, particularly impressive. Paladar is just a private restaurant. Mostly restaurants in Cuba belong to the government. This one belongs to you know, private people. So it's Cuban food, very homely, made in home maybe to say and the other thing is have reasonable prices. So the end of another great Havana night. I'm not going to round it off with a cigar, but my friend is. Good morning. Old Havana is full of churches and this was the first Espiritu Santo, Holy Spirit. It was created in 1636, though not much of the original has survived. During the age of slavery, runaway slaves used to seek sanctuary here. And if that's a little too austere for your tastes, one block away there is a feast of Baroque. This Baroque beauty looks as though it's been transplanted from Italy with trompe l'oeil murals that are the best of their kind in Cuba. You might see some believers in Santeria who come to pray to Obatala, the Afro-Cuban equivalent of the Virgen de la Merced. One Havana church you can't visit on a Sunday is St Francis of Assisi. If you could peek inside, this is what you would see. It's no longer used for religious ceremonies, but it does have some interesting architecture. In the square outside, I met a happy British traveller, Susanna Devine. Havana is absolutely amazing. It's, um, it's full of culture, full of spirit. Um, you walk down side streets, after every single turn, there's something absolutely amazing to look at. Um, there's amazing artists, musicians, um, just the culture and the spirit of the people is fantastic. I really do try to make your life and my life easy. Just two minutes walk from the Church of San Francisco is this restaurant, La Imprenta, a form of printing works. Hope it leaves a good impression. Didn't catch up on what's happening in the world. I wonder what's hot off the press. Ah, oh, look at this, the independent traveller. And what's in it? Ah, uh, oh, he looked as though he knows what he's talking about. This is my type of place. Look, I've got lobster, prawns, some very nice pork, a bit of rice and vegetables. And for this, I simply need to shell out 10 pounds. Before you spend, 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 you are gonna to need to understand how Cuba's money system works. I've just changed some. Here's how it goes. The hard currency, which is what most tourists will spend most of the time, is the convertible pesos. And you get about 
160 to your pound. However, the local economy is based on the ordinary peso and you get 24 of these for one of these, if you see what I mean. It's a bit confusing, but the short answer is if you can spend local pesos, it's probably going to be to your advantage, but most of the time you're going to be spending these ones. CUC is the code. To find out how the dual economy works in practice, just cross the road. All these lovely people are queuing up for Coppelia, the city's finest ice cream parlor. Now, if you pay in Cuban pesos, moneda nacional, then you will find that you get very good value as a foreigner. However, if you don't want to stand in the sun for hours, simply take your convertible pesos and go to the special hard currency parlor. I might be Guillermo sin amigos, but I'm very happy here. Hard currency ice cream. Just the same as ordinary ice cream, but quicker. This is Old Havana's main shopping street, Calle Obispo. Using some of my local pesos, I'm gonna buy some local bananas from this very nice man. Uh, Quanto cuesta? Ocho pesos, mamo. Ocho, okay, that's about, hang on, uh, one third of a real Cuban peso. That's about 50 yeah. cents for all these very nice bananas. Muchas gracias. Mm. In the shadow of the Havana Libre Hotel here in Vedado, there's a daily street market where you can buy all manner of arts, crafts and souvenirs aimed to distill the spirit of Cuba. Afterwards, it's well worth coming into the Habana Libre Hotel itself because apart from having 544 rooms, it's also something of a shopping mall where you can buy anything from a Havana cigar to an airline ticket. And you can find out about the role of the hotel in Cuba's revolutionary history. 19th of March, 1958, the finest and flashiest hotel in all of Latin America opens as the Havana Hilton. Less than a year later, on the 1st of January, 1959, Havana falls to the revolutionaries and Fidel Castro establishes his command center here. It's later renamed the Havana Libre. Free Havana. Cuba's unique culture infuses the streets of old Havana and is evident here in this remarkable city block just on the edge of Havana Vieja. It's full of civilian and military hardware that tells the story of Cuba's revolutionary struggle in the 1950s. From the assault on the Moncada barracks in 1953 through to the cabin cruiser Granma on which Fidel Castro, Che Guevara and 80 other revolutionaries sought to land to overthrow the tyrant Batista. Unfortunately, only 13 of them survived. The revolution may have begun badly, but it rapidly gathered momentum. And by the end of 1958, the game was up for Batista. In the early hours of New Year's Day 1959, he fled the presidential palace. And one week later, Fidel Castro gave his first address in Havana from that very balcony. Today, the presidential palace is now the Museum of the Revolution, where you find all the history. You may find it confusing that a place of such finery now celebrates communism. I find it intriguing. It's as though the Cold War never ended, which as far as Cuba and the US are concerned, it hasn't. The museum is fascinating and of course tells the story of Cuba in the last hundred years or so from the point of view of the winners. I guess it's aimed more at the children of the revolution than at foreign tourists. Even after the revolution, it was slightly more complicated than simply transforming Cuban society. In April 1961, there was an invasion at the Bay of Pigs to the south of Havana. This is the Soviet tank from which Commander-in-Chief Fidel Castro fired the first shot against the American ship Houston. They had a problem. Here's a Sunday afternoon stroll with a difference. The Atlantic to your right, Old Havana to your left, and in the background, 
the capital's splendid seafront drive, the Malacón. La Punta Park takes its name from the fort guarding the entrance to Havana Harbour, San Salvador de la Punta. It's one of several fortifications built by the Spanish to protect Havana Harbour from the unwelcome attention of competing colonial powers and pirates. Today, it's an excellent place to get a fresh view on a fine city. Well, what could be better than watching the lapping waters of Havana Harbour? I know, drifting across it. I've saved my favourite piece of Havana public transport for last. This is the funny little ferry that shuttles across the harbour in about five minutes. It costs one peso, just a couple of pence, and gives you some magnificent views of this beautiful harbour. Ferries sail every 15 minutes with a brief security check before you board. Havana was the key to the Spanish main and had to be defended at all costs. No fewer than eight forts were built to protect the harbour, of which this one, San Carlos de la Cabana, was the latest and greatest. And it's here because of the British. In 1762, the Royal Navy took control of Havana and occupied Cuba. The following year, the island was handed back to the Spanish in exchange for Florida. And to prevent any more maritime mischief, Spain constructed the mightiest fort in the Caribbean. Even in the 20th century, this place had military significance. One of the commanders in the revolution established his command centre here. His name, Comandante Ernesto Che Guevara. Che began work on the rebuilding of post-revolutionary Cuba here and later became the Minister for Banking and Industry. But then he sought to spark insurrection in Bolivia and in 1968 was shot there. Where you go from here is up to you. You could just return to the warm embrace of old Havana or set off to explore the rest of this intriguing island. The Via Blanca Highway begins just outside the fort. Whichever you choose, I hope that Havana will prove one of those rare places that stays with you siempre en tu corazón, always in your heart. <laughs>